come to expect as normal. It doesn't have to be like this. This is the institutionalization of greed. It's Russell Brand to speak to Lord Rothermere, say it's about uh, living here and taxes. Hello? Every crisis is an opportunity to change the system, to change direction. Power isn't there. Power is here. That's amazing. Our challenge as people is to say, we will not let this happen anymore. We will bring back power into our own hands. Things can change. Things do change. So I'll wait here, see if he's around. He's hot around. He must be up there working. No, Four million a year, he's probably grafting. In the 1950s, Ash addressed this question using very concrete stimuli. He assembled groups of seven to nine college students in a classroom for an experiment ostensibly about visual judgment. He then presented a series of cards like this. Going around the group, participants then had to identify which of the lines on the right matched the line on the left. The twist was that in reality, all the participants except one were confederates of Ash who had secretly been instructed to give the wrong answer on 12 out of 18 sets of cards, starting with the third set. Ash tested 123 subjects. In normal circumstances, subjects gave incorrect answers less than 1% of the time. With the social pressure of the confederates applied, that shot up to an incidence of around 37%, with 74% of subjects conforming to the majority on at least one critical trial. Subjects didn't necessarily conform straight away, some started out defying the group for a couple of rounds, but became gradually more hesitant and quiet before conformity eventually kicked in. Ash proposed that conformity could be explained by distortions occurring at any of three levels, perception, judgment and action. At the action level, subjects believe the majority are wrong, but go along with them anyway. At the level of judgment, subjects perceive there is a conflict, but reject their own judgment, concluding the majority are right. At the level of perception, subjects' perceptions are genuinely distorted by the majority answers. A recent neurological study by Burns and colleagues investigated these three explanations, using magnetic resonance imaging to examine the brain activity involved in this social phenomenon. 32 subjects were tested in all, and this time the task involved mentally rotating two 3D objects to decide whether or not they matched. As with Ash's experiments, the rest of the group were confederates instructed to give predetermined right or wrong answers. Consistent with Ash's findings, subjects on average conformed 41% of the time. But of course, the main thrust of this experiment was to see what parts of the brain were associated with this conformity. If conformity occurred at the level of perception, areas like the occipital and parietal lobes used in visual spatial awareness would be expected to show activity. If it occurred at the level of judgment and action, other areas would be predicted, such as the orbitofrontal cortex used in decision making. The MRI scans showed activity in the occipital parietal network, supporting the perception explanation. If it's true that subjects' perceptions are genuinely distorted, 
that means that group opinion has the potential to affect an individual's information processing on a very profound level. Now I'd suggest it's not possible to generalize these results back to Ash's subjects. I'd suggest there's a substantial difference in difficulty between the two tasks, so that with the rotation task, subjects might well be more prone to rely on other people's judgments. To be sure the same brain processes are at work in Ash's experiment, subjects would have to be tested doing his single line task. And even though the perception explanation was supported here, we know that the other two processes do exist. We can all think of instances in our lives when we've knowingly gone along with the majority despite private reservations or preferences. There are loads of human mechanisms that can work for us or against us. Our pattern seeking behaviors led to all kinds of scientific breakthroughs where we've correctly identified valid patterns in nature. It's also given rise to all kinds of irrational superstitions where we've imagined patterns and relationships that have no basis in reality. Weaver argues that we assess an opinion's popularity by how familiar it is to us, how many times we've heard it. And unfortunately, our brains don't always distinguish between an opinion expressed by many individuals and an opinion merely repeated by the same few. We can be self-defeating in our conformity. Say we have a group of people holding opinion X. Unbeknownst to the group, half of them secretly disagree, but due to the social penalties they've seen dished out to a few individuals who have disagreed, they keep quiet. By conforming, we add to the statistics of groups we don't actually belong to and perpetuate the idea of majorities who may not actually exist. Imagine if none of us conformed in that way, how that would change the social landscape. Just knowing about Ash's experiment makes us less susceptible as potential subjects in similar experiments. The more aware we are of our vulnerabilities to conform on any level, the better we're able to defend against it. It's easier to be skeptical towards groups we don't belong to or that we've broken away from, but conformity really kicks in in the groups we identify with. To get the support and acceptance we might seek from those groups, we can find ourselves giving up more than we bargained for in return. Being part of a group doesn't mean agreeing with every part of that group. We should always feel able to voice legitimate criticisms with any group, whether that's family, friends, social interest groups, whoever. When we stop feeling able to do that, we give those groups a status and authority that they don't deserve and that they actually don't possess. If a group can't handle legitimate dissent, it's not a group I want to be part of. Thinking is the first step, doing is the next. Some people spend years reading self-help books, having profound realizations, epiphanies, breakthroughs in their head. Then they're sometimes deflated to find that with all that amazing awareness, their life doesn't seem to change. It doesn't change because despite their insights, they don't change their behavior. Awareness is important, but behavior is just as crucial. Burns' study showed that subjects who went against the group exhibited brain activity associated with emotional arousal. It feels risky to stand out, but as with most things, the more you do it, the easier it feels. I think it's important to push ourselves in life, to stretch ourselves. If we don't expect much from ourselves, we can stagnate, but expectations need to be realistic our own expectations and other people's expectations of us. Disappointing people can actually be very humanizing. It can give those we disappoint the opportunity to realize that their demands might not be reasonable. So I'm throwing open an invitation to consider some of the things we conceal about ourselves in order to conform. Preferences, activities, beliefs, physical characteristics that violate no one. But for some reason we submit to a perceived consensus that they're unacceptable. What kinds of fears lie behind our conformity on these things? Are these judgments rational? You don't like to dance? Don't dance. The ideas, the books, the films, the people that inspire me are the ones that celebrate diversity, individuality, authenticity. I've certainly never been inspired by anyone who's encouraged conformity to the group, anyone who's tried to encourage fear or tried to shrink my comfort zone. People who come out with this kind of fallacious bullshit. Have you? I say question this stuff. Question the group. Oh, life is bigger. It's bigger.